Hey guys, welcome to the fifth part of making a simple HTTP server in Java. In this fifth part, we are going to start implementing the HTTP protocol. This is going to help us make sense of what the browser is asking our server and is going to allow us to start serving pages and files properly. Right now, at this point, our server basically accepts concurrent connections and it just simply shoots back an hard-coded HTTP response. So the results the browser are getting are basically this, always the same. And we are completely disregarding what the browsers are requesting. So how do we go about implementing the HTTP protocol? Well, the protocol is really well defined in a couple of RFCs from the Internet Engineering Task Force. And we are basically going to be referring to the first two ones on this list. If you've never read an RFC before, this is actually a really good introduction. Also have a small note here to let you know that the HTTP protocol is quite big and has a lot of particularities to it. And we are not going to be implementing every single thing about it. We are just going to be skimming through it and implementing whatever we feel it's necessary for this small project. So before we dive into the RFCs, I want to grab a request from the browser that our server receives just so that we can use it as an example later on and see what's going on. So to do that, we go to the HTTP connection worker thread and we use the input stream that we get from the socket to read the bytes that are coming in. So we do input stream read. And this basically returns an int, which we are going to call byte like this. So this is just reading one. We want to make this a loop. So we do a while. And we say that the byte equals to this read. And we keep on going while it is bigger than zero, like so. And now we use system out and we print the char, sorry, char like this. We say that we cast the int to a char like so. Let's give it a run. And let's call it. Let's see what happened here. Okay, perfect. We have our first uh, HTTP request received from the from the browser. It apparently got stuck here. And the reason is because the we are still on this loop, although the browser isn't sending anything else. We are still on this loop because we haven't received anything that's smaller than zero. But that's fine. We just need this as an example. Let's stop this and let's create here a small file, which we're just going to call request.txt. So, and let's place this in there. Perfect. I'm also going to place it here on a slide so we can follow along. So let's jump into the RFCs now. So let's grab straight away the RFC 7230. We're just going to skip this bit and jump straight into the table of contents. So the first section here, number one, is going to basically describe the notation that this document uses. The second bit it's going to describe how the protocol is supposed to work and 2.7 is actually quite interesting. And it's going to be important to understand the URI scheme that it's used on the requests. But let's jump straight away into message format. This is chapter three. So chapter three starts straight away with a small description of what the HTTP message should look like. And then we have this notation, which basically explains each section of the HTTP message. A very important detail that we should be looking for is also the encoding that's going to be used. And in this case, it's US ASCII. So an HTTP message has to start off a start line and we can visualize it like this. Then it can have zero or more header fields. So a header field. And because it can have more than one, we do this, but it also can have zero header fields, which leads to the carriage return line feed that separates the header fields from the message body. And we finish the HTTP message. 
But looking at the RFC, we understand that the message body is actually not mandatory, it's optional. So we update the diagram to reflect that. So let's zoom in so we can start breaking down some of these sections. And we start with the start line, which is 3.1 of this document. So a start line is either a request line for requests or a status line for responses. Let's update the diagram again. And because what we are really interested right now is on the request line, because we are passing requests, let's move to the request line bit. So over here, we see that a request line is basically a method, and then it has a space and a request target and a space, HTTP version and a carriage return line feed. Let's update the diagram one more time. And now for the method, we see that a method is actually equals to a token. And a token is defined on the RFC 7231, section 4. Let's jump to it. And basically we have here a description of all the methods that we can implement. So let's update the diagram just one more time with these tokens, just to visualize what we're talking about. All in all, all we need to do is to write a parser that follows this diagram. So how are we going to go about passing the HTTP requests that we receive? So the first thing to know is that there are two types of parsers. There are parsers that work with a tokenizer first, which basically breaks the stream of chars that they receive into tokens, and then the parser works on the tokens. And then there are those parsers that don't do this. These are called the scannerless parsers or lexerless parsers. These ones analyze the data as it arrives and just do the parsing straight away. So for our project, we are going to use a scannerless parser. And the main reason for that is that we are going to be analyzing the message as it arrives and detecting errors sooner and just dropping the connection if we find that a request is malicious or it's not well made. So let's start working on our parser. First of all, let's close this request text file that we just created. We can always refer back to it. Let's also delete these lines that we've used to get the request. And now, before we dive into the code, let's grab our POM and let's add this dependency for JUnit. So, and dependency, and the group is going to be org. JUnit, unit dot Jupyter. So like this one exactly, and release and keep the scope as test. We'll be using JUnit while we develop to test our parser. Let's close this and let's start doing our parser. So in here. We are going to create a new package called HTTP, like so. And we are going to create a class which is called HTTP parser, like this. Let's also create the logger now. And let's create a method to pass the HTTP request. We are going to name it pass HTTP request. This. And we are going to make it receive an input string. That is because that's what we have while we are working on the socket. Like this. Now you notice that we are not making our method static and that's basically a design decision. This is going to make us have to create an HTTP parser for each of the threads that we are working with. This is going to allow us to do some configurations on the HTTP parser. This, this is a design choice. You could do it with a static and basically use the same method in every thread. 
I would much rather have a HTTP parser object in each thread and basically use it. Now let's create a JUnit for this method. So we do generate test and we are going to select this method and create OK. Add. And let's create an object scope variable of the type HTTP parser. And let's create a before class method. that is going to instantiate this variable like, like this. I'm going to say use this notation before all and let's give it a run. Should give us some errors when we run it now. Yeah. And that's because we didn't make it static. So I'm just going to add this annotation to the class like this. And let's give it a run again. Perfect. So now let's create a method to generate a test case for us. So private input stream. Now let's import that and generate valid test case like this and inside this method let's create a raw data string which we are going to fill in with the request that we captured so copy let's go inside here paste and let's replace all the slash n with slash r slash n so replace all and let's also add another one here, like this. So this is a valid HTTP request. And now let's create a stream. Stream like this. New byte array input stream like this. And we're going to use the raw data and get bytes with a char set and we are going to use standard char sets this US ASCII like this perfect so what's happening here We are importing the wrong one. Let's see what it tells us. Perfect. And now we have a problem with the language level. So let's open the POM. Let's go over here and add some properties. Like this. And let's create the Maven compiler dot source this one point eight. Let's create another one which is the target. This save. Let's go over here to the Maven project and re-import. And it cleared all the trouble. Okay. And now we return the input string. Now inside the test method. We are going to call the method on the parser, so pass HTTP request. And we are going to use this input string for our test case. Let's save and let's give it a run just to see if everything is going up, is going, is working correctly. And it is. So good. Now we have a quick way of executing our parser and test it with some data. Let's give it a look at this slide once again. And as we can see, we have a lot to pass through. So we need to break this down into smaller little pieces. And we are going to start with the start line. And on the start line, we are interested in the request line because we are passing an HTTP request. So an HTTP request 
the first thing that it receives is a method. And immediately after that, a single space. We can see eight methods here, which are the ones that are defined on the RFC 17231. But these are not all the methods that exist. There are a lot more. And according to the RFC, the ones that we really do need to implement to make our server compliant are basically the get and the head. The RFC also states that the request methods are case sensitive. And by convention, the standard methods are basically in all uppercase. Then it goes on to say that if a method is not recognized, we should return an error code of 501. And if we recognize the method, but for some reason it can't be executed, we shoot a 405. And we have everything set up and ready. And this is basically all the theory done. And we can start writing the parser. I'll stop now because this is going on for already 15 minutes. But before I go, I'd like to thank Niagu Andre for pointing out an error on the previous code, which is now fixed here. And there are a couple of links in the description. Don't forget to check them out. And we have this code now on GitHub as well. So you can go and check it out over there. It's going to get updated as we go. And thanks so much for sticking around. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave any comments that you may have. Thanks so much and see you in part six.